Let's have a word of prayer and let's get started. It's uh, 2.30. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity of getting together. Um, and we're here to wrestle, to learn, um, to be challenged. Um, and, and the thing with challenges, Father, is that sometimes we go into denial areas and it gets difficult, it gets hard. Um, we're dealing with a generation, Lord, that only you can give us the wisdom of how to work with them in an appropriate way. And so we thank you for this incredible challenge. It's wonderful. And yes, we're going to get tired. And yes, we're going to be in moments of respite that we need to take. And yes, there's going to be moments that we're going to be frustrated. And there's going to be moments that we have no idea what we're doing. But it's the call that you have given us. And we're going to accept it, Lord, gladly accept it and fight in your might. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 Um, so you can press, when you get the presentation on, can you press uh, enter one? Yeah. Because that's, that's not the first slide. Enter one. Enter one. There we go. Thank you. So hi, my name is Peter Casillas. I'm from Washington, D.C. Um, my area is evangelism and church planting. And within my area, I have a great passion for young adult professionals and working with youth um, because we have a great challenge in our hands. At least in the D.C. area, we are challenged with a great, uh, amazing challenge, a beautiful challenge. We have a lot of millennials in the D.C. area, and they're growing like crazy. And our churches are, we just have like probably like three or four churches that are suitable for our millennials to come in and to explore, to belong, and then to be blessed. Um, so, so today, I'm, I'm coming to you not as an expert. I'm not an expert. I come to you with struggling heart. And I want to struggle together with you. And... The reason why you have this big, huge piece of paper in front of you is because during this presentation, we're going to have some stop moments where we want to have conversations and dialogues. I want you to have a conversation in your table, and I want to, you, we're going to have some conversations between us. But that paper, so you, with your group, with the different type of mentalities that are in your group, that you may devise a plan for a, leader, for a youth group or a, a, a young adult professional people group, in other words. And so I want you to create a path of how you're going to reach them. And I'm not going to make it easy for you, okay? The, the youth group that I'm going to present, the, 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 the people that we're going to reach, that all of us are going to reach, that you're going to make a plan for, are people within that, that context, the youth that are there, they're millennials, number one, number two. Um, they come from different cultural backgrounds. Um, some of them are Muslim. A lot of them are, are from the LGBT community. Um, they, um, they, some of them uh, don't believe in God. Some of them do believe in God. Some of them uh, believe a lot in spirituality. And so that's the, that's the group that you're going to be working with, all of you. And I want you to come up with a plan. So as we go through this process, I want us to struggle together. And I want us, I want us to talk to the challenges, you know, of, of what it means to reach this generation, this generation, because we need to, when, when we're thinking about, when we're thinking, when we're thinking about um, reaching the youth, we, we need to think outside of our church. We can't think inside only. If you think inside only, you're going to lose them. Are you with me? If, if you're trying to do everything you can to control the environment, so those that are inside do not leave, you're basically going to lose them. They're going to be squeezed. You need to reach out in order to, get, to have them stay. And so, so we, we're going to, all this to say, I want to wrestle together with you. So let's, let's start with the assumptions and paranoia. So let's start with the paranoia. And our, and our first paranoia is the following. I am missing, I am missing, can you press, can you press one and then enter? One and then enter. 
There we go. Thank you. Now we are. Okay, so, so the first thing is leadership. This is a paranoia. Leadership is for people who got it together. Now I want to ask a question. Who has it together here? If leadership is only for those who have it together, who, you know, you're going to wait forever. You, when you think about leadership, you need to think about it in a, in a very fluid way. It has to be very fluid, very circular. I know there's a lot of builders and baby boomers here, and w they think in a straight line, and I understand that type of thinking because my brother is that way. And when I sit down with my brother, we have interesting conversations. But when you think about leadership with this generation, we have to think about leadership in a very fluid way. And so no leader, leader has it together. We need to cooperate. And I think, uh, I think Ty Gibson did a great presentation today when he spoke about those areas of leadership. Instead of being the one in charge and follow me, how can we do it together? How can we walk as a tribe and move in a direction and bless and reach and do the things that we need to do? So all of us here are leaders. Are leaders. All of us here have skills. All of us here have the genius to accomplish what we need to accomplish in order for them to stay with us, in order to reach them and bring them into a relationship with Christ. So the first thing I want to ask you, please believe in yourself. Because God did it a long time ago. He actually extended his arms at the cross and he died for you. That's how much God believes in you. And so all of us are leaders. So the, the second thing I want to go to is our first assumption. Our first assumption is we know what they need. Now, I, you, you have no idea how much, I'm, I'm struggling with the mic because I, I hate walking with a mic. Um, you have no idea how much, how many times I've sat down with a church and a church, they start defining what their plans are for the youth or for the community outside, etc. And they know everything about them. And so I asked the question, what have you done? Have you had conversations with them? Have you talked with the leadership of the community? Have you talked with the principal, with the police, with the firemen? Have you talked with the mayor? Have you spoken with people randomly? Have you spoken with the youth? Have you sat down with them? Do you, have you watched a movie with them? Have you spent time uh, going down uh, you know, uh, some type of uh, uh, things that they find fun, like parachuting or whatever the case is? Um, have you spent time with them? Have you listened to their needs? And the 99% of the times I get a, a very interesting answer, and the answer is no. We assume that we know what they need. And the way that we assume what, that we know what they need is that we look into our experience and our story and the things that we think that are great. But it's interesting enough, every time I sit down with, uh, with, with millennials and I am going to tap it into my history, I get surprised that my history is of no interest of them, for them. So every time I sit down with a group of millennials, I am blind. I don't know what's going to happen. And because of that, I need to just sit down, chill, and just be with them. And find out what really are their needs. What really moves them. So, so this assumption can take us into all sorts of problems. And what I found very interesting is that a lot of people start dissing on the younger generation. Be, oh, they don't understand. Oh, they don't want to. And, and you know what that's called? That's called denial. It, that, that means that you don't want to deal with them because it's too hard. It's going to be hard work. And you just don't want to go there. So, you know, let just, let's just diss them. Let's, let's give them pizza and hold them hostage in a room. And all we do is kind of feed them, you know, but, but there's more to that because they're looking for more than just a piece of pizza. Um, and so one of the, I think we're having all sorts of problems <laughs> with the computer. Um, I want to share with you a series of pictures. Um, and so I'm going to go over there, see if we can, can somebody check on my computer? Somebody savvy, computer savvy. <laughs> There you go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so funny thing, you know, I, I live in D.C. and I spend time, uh, I, I have this job that I do at 7 o'clock in the morning every single morning is that I, I go to the White House and I, and I kind of polish Donald Trump's shoes. <laughs> it's huge. 
It's beautiful. Um, and I'm actually going to tweet about that. But um, <laughs> I live where he is. He's, he lives right now, and it's been interesting. Uh, interesting to be in the D.C. area and the ministry opportunities that have opened. We praise God for what's happening in D.C. Um, so we're almost there. One of the one of the things. So let me share with you a little bit what I'm doing over there until we get some connection here. Okay, here we are. So I want to share with you some pictures. I want you to look at these pictures, and uh, I want you to you know feel free to talk with the person right beside you on your table. But let's 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 look into this. And it might be that you have seen these. When you look at this one, look at it as a metaphor. And think about church when you're thinking about that metaphor. Now, I wonder how many of you were thinking, wow, that's true, that's happening, that's happening, that's happening in my youth group, or I can see that happening in my children, or so on. Um, I think these pictures depict some interesting messages. I want you to take two minutes, two to three minutes. I want you to turn around, look at the people at your table, and I want you to discuss these pictures. What are they telling us? What are, they, what are this individual, this artist, or these several, uh, several of these artists are telling us? What are they telling us? Let's take three minutes for that. Go for it. I want you to work. I don't want you to just listen to me. I want you to work. What did you see? What did you see? What caught your attention? How do they connect to the mission?
I want you to add another question to your dis discussion. Which of these which of these pictures reflect one of your values, one of your practices? So sorry, the tech crew ended up at a different place. Don't worry, don't worry. Can I do anything now? Is everything under control or what um, else can I do here? We're, we're rolling. Sure. No problem. Don't, okay. worry. Okay. don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Okay. Ten seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. So I'm going to point randomly at a table, and I want you to tell me in one line, one, one sentence, your discussion, okay? I'm just going to point out. I want to, go, I want to go back to that table all the way in the back, right there. The guy with the beard, right there. You don't have, you don't have to answer, but that table right there. Give me a one-liner. What, what, what conclusion you guys came to? Okay, so if I understood you right, like we act that we're okay, but we're not really okay. Care. Care. Okay, care. Thank you. Okay, what about what about this table right here? Well, don't don't be surprised. It's I'm gonna peel. <laughs> we, talked it's, um, we talked about a similar uh, theme over there uh, about the difference between your words and your deeds, uh, and we also talked about their particular image with the. the diary and the calendar, we'll pick it on the phone. To me it illustrates that, uh, that the phone is just a part of what people are, young people are. It's just a tool and we have to be aware of the changes that they're dealing with and, uh, and, and help, help to educate them to use it effectively. Yeah, it's cool. Let me go to that table down there all the way in the corner. What do you guys come up with? Just a one-liner. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, um, and isn't, isn't that true? More and more people are more interested in making themselves feel good. I mean, uh, you look at all, <laughs> you look at, you look at, at, at all the, the type of, of, uh, of religions that have come out of self-help and so on, and it's a focus on self. It's a very interesting thing. Um, let's keep on going. Um, so, so there's this guy named Simon Sinek, okay, and Simon, speaks about we always need to start with the why. We always need to start with the why. And so the why is a very important thing. He, he, he explains that the why is the place to start because the why is where the heart is. Okay, so you always start from the heart. What is your passion? What is, what is that you most love? You know, because the why drives you into action, into behavior, into values, and so on and so on. And so he also says that a lot of people start with the what. So, what do we do, or how do we do it, or... Um, and so, another, another group of people, we start with the how, so how we do it, you know, how we work it out. And the truth of the matter is that we need to start with the why. Why? And when it comes to, when it comes to us, you know, most of you are here because you're interested in, in how do we reach the millennials, how do we reach this group, how do we, how do we connect with them? And so I am myself asking the same question with you guys. Uh, right now, we, we, we just uh, did in, in, 2000, in November 2016, we did uh, an event called Inspire. It was directed towards young adults. And to tell you the truth, we planned for a year and three months we were planning this event. And I kid you not, we were blind all the way through. We had no idea 
what we were doing, and we did the event anyway because we decided to just figure it out and find out why. Now the reason why we did the event is because we had something very clear in us, and it's why. Why did we want to do that? Because we have an incredible passion for the young adult professionals and the millennials in our area. We want them to connect with God. We want them to have a relationship with God. We want to acknowledge them. We want to acknowledge their creativity. We want to acknowledge the, uh, their leadership. We want to acknowledge what they're about. And we want to, we want to become, uh, to, to enter in some type of relationship where we can mentor, where, where they don't know, and where we don't know that they can mentor us, and we can walk together. So we kept on going with what we called the Inspire Experience. And when we sat down with the young adult professionals, they, sat, they told us very straight, if you're gonna do an event to preach to us, don't do it. And right there, my first agenda of the night was, it got down because I had all the names of all the speakers and everybody, and I said, okay, cross that. No speakers. And so I asked them, so what do you guys want? Let, let's talk. And so they told me, why don't we do something where we do something? Now, can you explain that? Well, well, that means that we would like to do something in this event while you're doing this event for us. So we came up with seven projects. One of the projects was uh, Buskin, by the way. Um, we did the project Buskin. We had improv, so we were, we were accentuating the arts. Um, we had... Um, uh, we had a homeless uh, min uh, project that we had. We had a, a home improvement project. Um, and then we had, uh, it, it was a, a, a mixture of, of uh, acts of kindness with uh, rap music. We had one of, one of, our, uh, one of our young adult professionals, uh, he, he, he believes in rapping, you know, you know what rapping is, right? They were, they were rapping the Bible, so, so he wanted to, to sing rapping, he wanted to sing verses and, and chapters to the people. So um, they came up with all these things. We, we did, we did the whole skeleton of the structure. We brought in Ted Light talks, and we brought Ted Light talks of people who are doing something. One of those people was Shalini David. Shalini J. David went to Uganda, and when she was in Uganda, she saw a little kid. And while she was in a mission trip, she asked the question, what is this little kid doing in the street? Why is he not being fed? Who is in charge of this little kid? Who can help him? And can we get some money to help him right now? And that stirred her heart so strongly that she decided to do an orphanage while living in DC. She did an orphanage in Uganda. And currently we have Crystalis is the orphanage that she has in Uganda. And now she's opening one in, in, in India. And uh, she's very passionate about it. And so we wanted people who were going to speak to our young adults who have done it, who have struggled, who can talk about failure and success. And that's how we did the program. So we started the program with all that. They got involved in all their projects. And the reason why we did what we did is because we asked ourselves, why are we doing this? We want to see them in a connection with Christ. And interesting enough, in that Inspire event, it, it just took a life on its own, and they ended up doing a mob flash. I had no idea this was going to happen, and suddenly I'm walking out on the street. We're in Silver Springs, downtown Silver Springs. They come up, and they start doing, they put some music on, and they start doing a mob flash, and people in the back of me were saying, that's a mob flash, that's a mob flash, and they started joining the mob flash, and they did their thing, and they gave out these dollar bills with, with a little note that said, hey, think about Jesus. He loves you. And that's how they expressed their, their, and they had a routine and everything. They were doing some moves and stuff. And, uh, it, you know, I thought to myself, I'm going to lose my job. And um, I also thought to myself, uh, it's okay to lose my job if this is the way that they're going to express their faith because I need to support them. And, uh, and, that's, and I was the oldest one in that place, in that whole scenario. I was grandpa. Um, so, so they did what they did, and then when we finally finished the event, and I was thinking I can go home, I can rest, they come up with another day idea. Uh, Trump's, Trump elections had just happened. The, the country was going through some hard times. D.C. was going through some hard times. They decided to do some hugging ministry, so they were giving free hugs. And they, made up, they, they brought this table with a, bunch of, with a bunch of paper, and people could write their thoughts and expressions, and they gave hugs and hugs. And people joined us also to give hugs. We even had a lady who had a sign of her own saying, do you need a free hug? 
And that's how it happened. And so now we're sitting down with the leadership team again and saying, okay, what are we going to do for them? We have no idea. We're still blind. You see, because the issue is the millennials don't have a niche. Survivors have a niche. Builders have a niche. Boomers have a niche. Millennials don't have a niche. They're all over the map. So if you thought, because you did one thing like this, that they're going to come, think again. It doesn't happen. They can go, they can watch movies of the 70s and the 40s, and they can watch movies of the 80s, and they can go all the way to movies in 2017 and enjoy them all. You don't. Those who are boomers don't. You see a movie in 2017, you're like, forget about that, that's from the devil. <laughs> you know, you, it doesn't happen, you see? So, so there's, that, there's that discrepancy, and, and, and so we, we need to really think about why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Why are you here? Why are you here? You need to answer that question for yourself first. As a person, why are you here? Uh, do you feel called? Is, is God calling? You have a passion for these young adults. You want to really do something for them. You really want to work with them. You really want to dive in into the messiness of it. Are you really passionate or are you here because you want to fix them so they can fit into your church square? You have to answer the question why. Because if we go to the how, we go to the what, without answering the why, we're just, mis we're just wasting our time. We're just playing, it, it's, it's kind of like, it's playing like, you know, I, at one time I had an ingrown nail, and I don't know how many of you have suffered from an ingrown nail, but when you have an ingrown nail, the most natural thing to do is ignore it. And you know, you hit something and you're reminded that you have an ingrown nail. And you think to yourself, I have to deal with it, but you know that there's needles involved, there's scissors involved, there's blood involved, and so you just ignore it. At least that's what I did. I thought I was gonna get better just by ignoring it. But I, every time I played basketball, I was reminded that I had an ingrown nail. And finally, I took the time to go to the doctor, go through the pain, and get it taken out, and now I'm ingrown nail free. I'm a very happy person right now. But the truth of the matter is, when we're dealing with this generation, what the church has usually done over and over and over, and, and don't get me wrong, I love my church, love it. But what we have been doing over and over and over again is just, just, just ignoring the nail, the ingrown nail. Uh, let's, let's just, you know, just, let's just drink a Panadol or, or let's just drink some, some type of, you know, something for the pain or let's, you know, put a Band-Aid on it, let's ignore it. And, but the truth of the matter is the pain is still there. We haven't worked with it, we haven't done well with it, and we still have it right there, and we need to do something. We finally have to wake up, because if we don't do something, we're gonna lose the generation again. Do you hear me? And so I praise God, because I'm looking into this conference, and I'm seeing how many people here are involved in ministry, and I'm seeing a lot of young faces, and I praise God for that. Because we need to start trusting them in leadership. So why, why are you here? I want you to define that. Take, only take five minutes, take five minutes, once you go to your group, and I want you, want each one of you, write on that piece of paper, that white piece of paper, why, why are you interested in this younger generation? Why do you want to do ministry with them? Why do you want to work with them? Let's go. Answer why.
Three minutes. One minute. Thirty seconds. Timothy Keller, Timothy Keller shares something that, that it, I think is very profound. And he says, uh, in order to be missional, and when we think about mission, we need to think in all directions. Not only think about the people outside of the church, but the people who are in your church, the people in your world of influence, your neighbors, et cetera, et cetera. When you, when you, when, when you want to be missional, people who are missional or churches that are missional Missional means that they understand what it means to not believe in God. They understand what it means to put yourself in the place of a person who looks at the church and sees the church as hypocritical. That's what a missional church means. So when you think about your why, you need to put, in your, you need to put yourself, you need to empathize with those who are not looking at the world through your lenses and they see it through their own lenses. You know, um, just recently, recently, I, I, I live in the United States, I, I, um, and I, I've seen and experienced some of the stuff that is happening over there in regards to prejudice. And I, always, I, was, I was always angry, a little bit angry, um, at the African-American community. Um, and I wondered why they emphasized so much the issue of, of racism and so on. And I went and I saw a movie called Hidden Figures. You've heard of it. I imagine you've heard of it. So I saw the movie Hidden Figures and I saw what happened. I, I, I was so angry in that movie. And I could hear and understand a little bit more because if I was in the shoes of them and live what they lived during that period of time, I would be in the same place where they are right now. You know, so, so we, need, we need, in order to be missional with the people, with the people group, and specifically with millennials, we need to be placing ourselves in their position. Why is it boring to sit down in church sometimes for them? Why do they prefer to get their phones out and start looking at their phones while everything is happening in church? You know, why do they do that? What's going on? What questions do you know? Uh, in the past, I, I, you know, I, I've been in, in some conference. I, I was one of, in one of, the, one of the conferences, and we had a, 
we, one of our pastors was doing incredibly great, and it had 400, 400 young adults were coming to a, an initiative he was doing, and it was growing. And all the churches, all the pastors and churches around that area were starting to get very angry because he, they came up with, uh, they're stealing my youth. Well, it's not that there's, he's not stealing nobody's youth. It's that the youth said, I want to go there because I feel more connected. That's all that was happening. Right? So the best question that those pastors could have asked was, okay, and the leadership of that church could have asked was, okay, what are we doing that they're running over there? And what can we do to bring them back? You know, what changes need to happen in our church, in our worship service? What changes need to happen in the way that we work out? Now, now when we say changes, immediately you say changes, everybody puts up their guard. Because <laughs> you're thinking about, no, no, you can't change this and change. Now, let me tell you something about the millennials. Something that we have discovered about millennials, and, and, and this was in a planning process that we were doing this, and somebody was talking that we have to be very progressive in our presentation, everything we do, and, and it was not true. We found that not to be true. There are millennials that love to be progressive, but there are millennials who love to be conservative. And when we discovered something about millennials is that we discovered they really dig the story of the Bible. They love the story of the Bible. That's something that they love. But sometimes we present the story of the Bible by just going here, a little bit here, and a little bit over there, and a little bit over here, and they don't get the whole picture, and that's when they're in their phones. And they're FaceTiming or liking or they're doing something, you know, or they're tweeting or they're snap chopping, whatever it is. <laughs> That's my Puerto Rican. <laughs> um, but something interesting uh, that we have found is that they, they, they don't have a label. They don't have a label. Um, and I, I sat down with a millennial. He, he asked to, to meet with me. And he sat down and he went all over the map. He talked about uh, a, a very conservative approach to a very liberal approach to present me with this book that he had read, with this thought, and how can I do this ministry, and how can I work in this way? And I was just looking at this guy, I'm like, this is, this is fascinating to me. Not defensive. I can speak about anybody, I can cite anybody, and he was right there with me. Let's dialogue, let's have the conversation, because that's something that they really appreciate. You see? Um, so, in order to be missional, we need to put our play, ourselves in the place, we need to know what it, what, it, what it means to struggle with the faith, what it means to struggle with Adventism, what it means, because one of the things that we struggle in the United States, for example, and they're asking us, they're asking us questions point blank, why are there two sets of conferences in our, in our church? That's what they ask us in the U.S. Why is there a conference that is for all the black people and there's a conference for all the white people and everybody, uh, all the cultural people fall in the middle somewhere? Why is it? You see? That's a, it's a good question. It's a good question. And it's something that, that they're challenging us and we're challenging our leaders. Answer us the question, why? Why is this necessary now, today? You see, that in the eyes of a millennial, that's hypocrisy. That's hypocrisy, you know? And, 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 and the best way that we deal with that hypocrisy is that when they point it out, we don't go defending, oh, you have to understand that this and that, but we're a church, we're all united, we're unit. No, you're not. You're not in unity. Look what's going on. That doesn't look to unity like me. You see, th that's what they're going to tell us. So the best approach is to say, you're right. I don't understand it either. I'm struggling with it. And now we have a conversation. Now we're able to talk from a place of authenticity and a place of relationship. Um, so why? I'm going to share my why. I'm going to share my why. And, and I, I, I hate to do this in a presentation, but there's going to be a little bit of a reading here, but I needed to put in this in, in the writing because I want you to get the picture of my why. My why starts here. Ellen G. White in Desire of Ages, my friend Ellen, I call her my friend Ellen, um, she says, through he heathenism, Satan had for ages turned man away from God, but he won his great triumph in perverting the faith of Israel. With what? With heathenism. What is heathenism? Well, heathenism, we find it very clearly in Genesis chapter 11. In Genesis chapter 11, we have a tower. The tower is called the tower what? Of Babel, which is a Hebrew name for Babylon, right? Okay. 
And something interesting, the tower is not an Israelite tower. I know G Genesis was written by Moses, but it's not an Israelite tower he's referring there. He's referring to what is called a sigurat. Okay? What is a sigurat? A sigurat was, it, it had a shape, like it was like a pyramid, and, and it had these stairs that went all the way up to this room. And in this room there was, a, there was beds, and there was a table, and there was food, because it was the belief that the God, the sigurat, would bring down the gods from heaven all the way into fallen humanity. That's the sigurat. Now the sigurat was not the center of the city, but it was right beside the temple because the gods would come down the stairs and they would go to the temple once in a while. But we know that never happened because in the time of Nebuchadnezzar, the, the wise men who are, who are threatened to be killed are saying, hey Nebuchadnezzar, we don't know the, 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 your dream, we can't tell you the meaning, and, and only the gods can, can tell you, and they don't live among human beings. So they had no idea what they were talking about. This was all their imagination. Are you with me? But right there in the sigurat, what happened is that God got distorted. And since then, in, 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 in Genesis chapter 3, where we have the fall of man, right? All the way to chapter 10 of Genesis, we have the progression of sin. But Genesis 11 accentuates something more dangerous, and that's the distortion of God. A distorted view of God is a distorted religion. It's a distorted spirituality, and it's a distorted practice of religion. Are you with me? You see, that is called heathenism. It's not, you know, social stuff that are happening here and there. That, that's secular stuff. Heathenism is distorting who God is, and that's what happens with Israel. Israel perverts who God is because Israel was supposed to show who God was, but instead of showing who God was, they perverted who God was, and they were showing a God just like any other Asian Near East God, a pagan God. Are you with me? Okay, so it says the principle that man can save himself by his own works lay at the foundation of the heathen religion. Salvation by works. It lays, it's right there. And it's so easy for us to say, yeah, I know what salvation work is all about, but you know, here's the thing. And let me explain it to you with a story. I'm in my conference office, and the ed educational director, he's gonna, he brought the, t the principals in, he's having a meeting with them, and he sets up the tables, very beautiful, and he puts these, these apples in front of each one of them, which I thought was, wow, that's awesome, principles, apples, that kind of makes sense. Um, and I was thinking to myself, man, those apples look so good. And I wanna, I wanna get, I wanna have one. I was like, I wanna, I wanna grab one. And someone is not gonna want an apple, and I'm gonna grab one of those apples. So I walked into the place where everybody was meeting. I looked to the side, I'm seeing if somebody was not really interested in the apples, because I was interested, in, I was hunting for an apple. And so, I looked to the back part, and the back part they had all these food, all this food, and there's some apples there, but they didn't look as beautiful as these. So I was like, I don't want those apples, I want this apple. This apple is the one I want. So suddenly the day finished, the principals have left, and I went into the room and I saw the apples there. And I'm gonna like, Somebody, somebody's apple disappeared today. And I just grabbed an apple and I went for the bite, and they were plastic. <laughs> And I looked back to the same table that I said the apples that I didn't want, and I went to that same table and I grabbed real apples, and they didn't look as good. You see, when we talk about salvation by faith, and, and we talk about, you know, this issue of the heathen religion, the foundation of salvation by works, salvation by faith, you know, it really looks the same. And a lot of people, millions of people on this planet have chosen salvation by works, because it looks so much like the true gospel that they have chosen to eat that apple. But that's not the apple. You see, the, the apple of the gospel is a lot more messy. It's a lot more messy. It's not that looking good. It's not that much perfect. It's very messy because God is dealing with each one of us in our own context. And so one of the reasons why I have my why there is because of this issue that so many millions of people, including our young people, including some of our churches, have believed this type of religion, sadly. So I have a why. Notice what, say, what it says now. It says, the message of salvation communicated to man through human agencies, and I love this about God that he uses us in spite of, but the Jews had sought to make a monopoly of the truth. Ouch, I don't know. 
which is eternal life. They had hoarded the living manna. I find that that's such a strong term, hoarded. And, and we need to, as, you, as we read this, you and I, I had to ask myself my quest, a question, am I hoarding the gospel? Are we hoarding the gospel? And notice it says, it turned into corruption. The religion which they tried to shut up to themselves became an, of, an offense. And notice it says, they robbed God of his glory and defrauded the world by a counterfeit of the gospel. They had refused to surrender themselves to God for the salvation of the world. Do, do you get something there? The, the reason why God has called us in, yes, he wants to save us and he loves us, etc. But there's a reason why he called you because he wants to employ you to reach others. You are it. You're the light that shines. You're the salt of the earth. You're all that stuff, you know. And, and, and you're the reason. It's through you who God's going to reach. And so they refuse to surrender themselves to that. And it says, the people whom God had called to, to the pillar um, and ground of the truth had become representative of Satan. They were doing the work that the, he desired them to do, taking a course to misrepresent the character of God. And, and Steps of Christ, Ellen G. White speaking about this, and she says that Satan did everything possible that men saw God as a judge looking for their sins, like a referee looking for their faults. And, and, and we have to ask, you, you have to ask yourself the question, I'm in my church, this is my ministry, are we doing this? Are we misrepresenting God? I found out churches are afraid of a God of love. Because you know what that means, right? That means love is love. And they come as they come in love is love. You, you with me? But the reason why God brings them to his people is because he hopes that through his people they can have this community, they can have these dialogues, they can have this sharing of bread where that person can become aware that this God really loves me and his love is transformative to my life. We miss that point. God love is love, but it doesn't leave you the same way it founds you. It loves you because, and because it loves you, it will transform you. But a lot of churches are uncomfortable with God, a, lo a loving God because when they come in in a certain way, it becomes difficult. This, this, this friend of mine, he brought his friend after one year, one year trying to convince his friend to come to church, came to church, one of the church leaders looked at him and said, hey, are, 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 are you homosexual? And the guy's like, what, what, why? And he says, oh, you have a little earring, you have an earring. And my friend, you know, he was like trying to, to ah, that's funny, that's funny, you know, trying to, you know, downplay it. But he was like, what? At the door, first time coming to church. Goes into church, worships, comes out, goes to the potluck, are eating. A leader of the church comes up and says, hey, are you homosexual? It never came back. You see, we, we, need, we need to understand the dynamics here. You know, uh, our churches are places for sinners to come. It's okay for them to come. And they're going to come all messed up, and it's okay for them to come all messed up. And what is our battle? Our battle is on our knees. We pray. We fight praying. That's how we pray. And, and make sure that when you're praying, pray, Lord, why am I having an issue with this? What's making me uncomfortable? What do you need to transform in my life? Are you with me? Are you with me? So, so interesting enough, it says, the people whom God had called to be the pillars of the ground of truth had become representative of Satan. They are doing the work that he desired to, them to do, taking a course to misrepresent the character of God and cause them, cause the world to look upon him as a tyrant. I pray that we're not doing that. That's my why. That's my why. And so my why has to do a lot with the temple. You know, in, in Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, it says, Make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And I love this verse for many reasons. And one of the reasons why is because God is dwelling among his people. And that was new for the, for the Asian Near East scenario, that n no God had ever dwelled with his people. And God is like camping with his people. Camping. Now, you know what it means to camp, right? 
you know, he wakes, he wakes up and his mouth smells like crazy, like, you know, it's horrible. <laughs> uh, you know, camping, she wakes up and, and there's no brush around, you know, she, it's hard for her to find a brush. You know, with camping, camping is that all the messiness is there. God is camping with his people. Everything happens, e all the ordinary things happen in his presence. And so what happens is that they, they do ordinary stuff in his presence, they worship in his presence, they sin in his presence. And you have to ask your qu a question, why? Because only in God's presence is where true transformation happens. It's not away from it. So God prefers you to have you here with all of your issues than have you away from Him. Are you with me? And so, and so this is my why. My why is that we need to bring them as much as possible. We need to get our churches open. We need to create safe places so they can come as they are and we can get into the business of blessing their hearts and working with them. Are you with me? That's my why. They probably know a God who's a tyrant, and that's not my God. And that's not our God. And so when they find a church that's welcoming, when they find a church who embraces and loves them, and I can tell you, we have a church in the center part of our conference, and there was a lot of older folks in that church but when the, when, the, when, the, when, the, when, the, when the young ones came in, they loved them. They cared for them. They fed them. They enjoyed them. They laughed with them. They had fun with them. And now that church is full of young adult professionals. Full. Just because they were willing to have the hard conversations. And some, and some things they disagreed, and they, and they still said that this is your place. We love you. We want to have you here. And so we need to create that safe place. We need to be passionate about it. That's my why. Now, let me share with you my what. My what is very simple. And I'm going to show you verses that you guys have seen before. Notice, Matthew says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what, I know to, uh, that's what I know. That's my what. Yeah, my why is I want to reach them. Why? Why? I want to reach them so I can bring them to Jesus. How, you know, and so my what is I want to baptize them. I want to bring them to a relationship with Christ. I want to be clear that they know who God is, that they can, they can grow in a relationship with God, and that that growth in a relationship with God is going to look different than mine. Number two, it says, Go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And the repentance and remissions of sin, this is how Luke, Luke expresses the Great Commission, should be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. What I love about Luke, Luke was such a doctor that he says, okay, this is how you're going to do it. Start in Jerusalem. And then Acts picks that up. And Luke is the, the author of Acts. And he says, and you shall be witness to me in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. That's your approach. That's your technique. If you want to plan how to reach people, use that. Start with Jerusalem, go to Judea, then Samaria, then to the ends of the earth. I assure you that you're going to have a vibrant, very vibrant youth group. You just follow that pattern right there. Now, I love this one, Feed My Sheep. John shares a story. That's how he shares the Great Commission, Feed My Sheep. He shares the story of Jesus and Peter. And then I, I love how Matthew introduces and, and this is how Matthew introduces this gospel changing movement, and, and this is one of my, my, my favorite what, is, is something that's gonna, that's, that has to challenge us. He says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And I heard this Friday evening that this is one of the reasons why you guys are moving in the direction you're moving as a conference. Well, I love this word repent. This word repent in the first century, we know that repent is repenting from what? from sin, right? But in the first century, they didn't hear that. In the first century, you had a lot of groups that were subversive. The people of God were kind of angry because even though they were out of exile geographically, spiritually, they were still in exile because they were under pagan, king, uh, a pagan uh, power. And so they wanted to get rid of that power. And they had the nationalists, and they had all sorts of groups, and they're figuring out some people went, and they tried to be very, very super holy to see if that would make God take this power away. Other people, they, they grabbed their swords and they fought. Uh, other people were, were in negotiations with the power to see if they can keep on going up. They had all these groups. 
All of them had this idea that the Messiah was going to come and be this earthly king and he was going to make us great again. That sounds familiar. And, and suddenly, and suddenly you, you have Jesus walks in, this carpenter, and probably all sweaty. And he walks in and he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. What, what they were hearing was repent. This word repent is let go of your agenda, trust mine. I have to repent many times because sometimes I'm thinking and I, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to work it out this way. I'm going to work it out this way. And sometimes I just have to stop, listen, assess, and let go of what my plans are. In order to work with this group, in order to work with your passion, in order to work with your church, you need to let go. Let go of your agenda and trust God. And so I love the video that you guys presented today. Let's go into prayer. Let's seek God's plans. Let's pray for a while. Let's, let's dive in there. Let's talk with God. Let's wrestle with God and say, okay, God, what, what direction? What do you need? Because this is serious business. These are hearts that we want to bring into heaven. So let go of your agenda. Let's live the way of the kingdom. And the kingdom is not referring to heaven. It's referring to the life of the kingdom, the way that the kingdom is lived. And Jesus lived the kingdom in such a powerful way. He spent time with all the people that everybody rejects in those days. Listen to a woman. Spend time with a woman. Is, is in the middle of the crowd and, and, and somebody's yelling at him and everybody's saying quiet, quiet, comes back to that poor blind guy and says, you know, what, what do you want? How can I help? Jesus just moved in directions that we didn't expect. He spits in the mud and, and he could have said with his words, you're healed, you're going to see, now see me. He could have said that. He didn't say see me. He didn't say that. He spits, makes mud, puts it in the eyes of this guy. It's kind of disgusting. That's what he did. This is what Jesus does. He does things that don't make sense to us, but he's, he's doing it for the purpose of meeting people where they are. He sits, I, I, one of my favorite, it just, it's, just, it's in my heart, and I shared it with the, with the high school tent. Um, it, it, he sits down with a Samaritan woman, and she's an outcast. We know she's an outcast because she's coming in the middle of the day to look for some water. And she's thirsting because she has issues. We know she has issues. And Jesus, it says that Jesus needed to go to, he needed. And it also says he's thirsty. So he needs to go. He's thirsty. He wants to encounter this woman. And how does he encounter her? He says, give me a drink. And we're saying, well, well yeah, give me a drink of water. But no, you have to understand the well in, the, in that time appearing, the well was the place where a boy meet, met girl. It was like the, what's up? How you doing? <laughs> And so here, here you do, here you see, Jesus starts a conversation with a Joey, for those who know friends. <laughs> he starts with a conversation with a Joey and says, how you doing? And this woman's reaction is, well, wait a minute, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, we don't, it doesn't work. And, and then, then Jesus goes into business, he says, if you knew who's asking you for water, you would ask him for water. You see, the brilliance of our God and Savior is that he contextualizes, he meets people in their language. And let me tell you something about us. As Seventh-day Adventists, don't we have a strong culture? We have a strong culture. And, and, and let me take Happy Sabbath, for example. Go to the mall and say Happy Sabbath to people. They're going to be like, what, what? this guy just told me Happy Sabbath. I don't know. I, I guess I'll have a Happy Sabbath. I don't know. They have no idea what that means. We have a strong culture. Another thing that we have strong, haystacks. Hey, do, do you want to eat some haystacks? No, thank you. I don't like grass. You want some taco salad? Now we're talking. You know, we, we have to understand that we have a language with this culture, and it's a very strong one. And then when we want to reach a people group and we want to be meaningful to them, we need, we need to change our language. We need to talk in a way that it makes sense to them. If I go to and I sit down with some, some agnostics, atheists, sit down with, well, Ellen G. White says, who's Ellen G. White? Sister White says, who's, is she your sister? You know, it doesn't make sense. You understand what I'm trying to say? So, so I, I love how it's, it's let go of your agenda, 
trust mine, let's live the way of the kingdom. Um, and so, and so it's, 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 it's for all people. It's for all people. And we need to be present. That we need to, be, we need to understand it's for all people. Church is for all people. That's my what? It's for all people. And I, I, I can't stress with you how important it is. I had the opportunity to pastor a church and one of the things I know, if, uh, let me tell you, I went to this church and I said to myself, I'm never coming back to this church. And, and a month later, I kid you not, a month later, God called me to the church as a pastor. The compound friends told me, Peter, I need you to be the pastor of this church. I'm like, what? So I go back to the church that I, I didn't want to go back to. And here I am in this church. And the reason why I didn't want to be there is nobody said hello to me, ever. I sat down. Nobody communicated with me. Nobody took the time to sit down. I was not important for them at all. And what's interesting, all, almost all Seventh-day Adventist churches, the first thing you walk into the church, everything, all the back seats, all the back pews are all full, and everything in the front is empty. <laughs> and you have to do the walk of shame. <laughs> You're late. Coming to the walk of shame. Walk front. I'm sorry. And you have to sit in front, you know, and, and our guests have to do the walk of shame. And I'm, I'm in this church. I said, I don't want to be part of this. And I... And I remember sitting down with the leadership and, uh, and you know, just praying, Lord, how are you going to work with us? And uh, I was thinking, we, we need to create a, 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 a safe zone here, a place where we f people feel welcome. And um, I remember I spent nine months talking with my church. The first three months, it was all vomit. Blah. You know that? Vomit. And they were angry. They were saying stuff. I had even one cursing. He was cursing. He was the leader. You're cursing. Don't you know we're cursing? <laughs> and I was like, it was so funny. And, and they were just, you know, going at it. And I was, oh, my goodness. And there, there was a lot of issues here in this church. Three months. And then the next three months, it was discovering who we are. Who are we? And then the next three months was why. Why? And you know how it happened? Our head elder, standing in front of the, the church, right there where the glass window was, and this lady from the community walks in and says, hey, um, I, I, I want to come in and worship. I, I really want to worship with you guys. I want to come into church. Let me use her language. I want to come into church. I just, I just, I, but I, I'm dressed, I, I look bad. I'm not in church clothes. And the head elder looked at her and says, don't worry about that. Come with me. He didn't point. He didn't open the door. He says, go through that door. It's okay. You'll be fine. He said, come with me. He walked with her opened the door, stood with her in the back, looked for a place to sit, found a place to sit, sat with her, worshiped with her, spent time with her, prayed with her, listened to the message with her, and then walked her out when we were saying goodbye, said hello to everybody. And that was the day that the church, the doors of our church opened, and we were getting 20, 15 to 20 people from the community coming into our church after that Sabbath. Our church went from 70 to 480 in attendance. <coughs> they, and it was them. It was them. It was, it was, it was this, you know, we, we, just, we just became aware. We became aware. And, and the landscape of our church changed. And a lot of people with tattoos started coming in. And a lot of people who were dressed very differently than we dress were coming in. And a lot of people who spoke differently were coming in. And I remember this one lady, she wrote me the same and said, Pastor, give me my church back. My seven-day Adventist church, give it back to me. And I looked at that, and I got mad at the beginning. But then I said, thank you, Lord. Because this is a witness of what we're truly doing here, is that your church is for all people. And it got messy. And it got difficult. And it's not easy. But it's the best. <coughs> I can tell you it's the best. I had the... It was so great to be in that experience and to see how people came to Christ and how they fell one by one, how they surrendered. Uh, it was just crazy. And um, I, I, I think I shared this story. Um, this one lady came up to me and says, uh, Hey, Pastor, I, I want you to come and preach to a church. Do you preach in any church? She says, Yeah, I preach in any church. Do you preach on a Sunday? Yeah, I preach on a Sunday. Do you preach in a gay lesbian church? Yes, I do. Take me. Why not? And there I went, and I walked in. They had an organ. 
They were playing hymns. They were singing. It was high church. I sat with them. I sang with them. And all of a sudden, this lady looked for me. She took me all the way to the front. I went to the front, and then she left me here. She says, go ahead, start. <laughs> I'm like, okay. And so I started preaching. I preached from John chapter 5. After I finished preaching, I had uh, like around 8 to 10 women who surrounded me. They, we, we went to ask you some questions. I'm like, yeah, do you preach? Like, do you preach a lot? And I'm like, yeah, I, 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 do. I think I do. I think I preach a lot, yeah. Like, what day? I'm, I, every Sabbath. Ah, what time? Around 11, 15, kind of. That's, that's around there, yeah. Okay, where, where? And, oh, in such and such place. Oh, okay, thank you. And they left. That was all. Next Sabbath, they were in the last pew, all sitting there, worshiping together with us every Sabbath. I didn't think the church was ready for me to say, hey, we have, no, they were not ready for that. <laughs> but it, they didn't know, but they still loved on them. You know, they still take care of them, you know. Um, and so this is, this is what it means, you know, for, uh, we, this is my what. My what is we need to get messy with, with, with where light is needed. Are you, do you understand what I'm trying to say? So we need to get messy with our group, with our millennials. We need to get messy with them. That's the way it is, you know. Um, so what is my how? Um, notice what Ellen G. White says, and I love this quote, and I, I hope you take pictures of it. And I hope you share it um, wherever you go, whatever leadership. It says, in the cities of today where there is so much to attract and please, the people can be interested by no ordinary efforts. Put forth extraordinary efforts in order to arrest the attention of the multitudes. Make use of every means that can possibly be devised for causing the truth to stand out clear and distinctly. Did you, did you get that? Did you get that? Did you get that? You, did you get it? No, notice it says, make use of every what? Every means. Do you think it finished here? No, it didn't finish here. It, get better. it gets better. And it makes me smile a lot. Whatever may have been your former practice, it is not necessary to repeat it again and again and again and again and again. That's my emphasis. And again. In the same way, God would have new and untried methods followed. What? What? Break it upon the people. Surprise them. That is, uh, I love it. I love it. Now, can you hear me? Now, 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 now understand. You, you, and, and let me tell you, for those, for those who are above the golden age or in the golden age, my head elder was 55. I think it was 55, yeah. His wife comes up to me and says, Hey, Peter. I'm putting my husband to be the teacher for our teenagers. I'm like, no way. There's no way I'm going to let that happen. And she looked at me. She says, do you have somebody else? Okay, I'm sharing this with you so you know that I had, I had very small resources. That I'm in, I'm in one of those churches that, you know, I, had, I didn't have a lot of resources. And so she looks at me. She says, do you have somebody else? I, I have nobody else, so he's going to be the teacher. And I was like, oh, well. So Brad comes up, sits with me, he says, Peter, can you, can you help me out here? So I, I give him some guidance and, you know, kind of check up on him, etc. This guy, he's a farmer, by the way, he was a farmer. And, and, I, I, and, and I love him with all my heart. And, and, he, and he spoke about corn and he spoke about all the stuff he did and we had spent a lot of good times together. This guy, he took a, a youth group, millennials, by the way, at that time, he took a youth group of four teenagers to 45 to 15 attendants. He was 55. He was boring. <laughs> I kid you not. I can tell this in his face. Brad, you're boring. I, he, who would he say, you're right? <laughs> <laughs> he grew them. He gave them purpose. He gave them meaning. He loved them. He accepted them. He got messy with them. He brought them to his house. They studied the Bible together. He went and did a mission with them. He lived the word of God in the eyes of these kids. They became fearless. Fearless. Going into any situation. Preaching to homeless people. Going everywhere. They were just at it. Wherever he pointed the finger, that's the place that they would go to. 55. 
You, you, you hear what I'm trying to say? And he found, he had to find ways of trying to get these people in. And one of the ways we found, because not, it's not only him, it's the whole church, we, we came into connection, okay, are, are young people important to us? Yes, they are. Okay, so no matter how they come in, let me tell you, some of our, some of our, you know, some of our, our, our kids, our youth, they came in and they would dress up all fancy, you know, and stuff like that. And some of them dressed in a way that, is, that, that made a lot of the church members tremble because they were looking good, you know, Hollywood good, like all, you know, stuff. And, and, and I remember th this, uh, this group of ladies sat down with me and said, hey, Pastor, you need to preach about clothes. <laughs> and I say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to take the pulpit to preach about clothes. I'm going to, let's, let's, keep on, let's keep on doing what we're doing. And so we geared the whole church into the direction, okay, what is important to us? They are important to us. Why are we doing that? We want them to see us. We want their friends to be in church. We want them to meet Christ. And so what we did is we started creating a worship service that had, it had many elements in it. We had a video at the same time I was preaching, and we had an illustration going on. And it was interesting how the church started sitting at that point. At that point, the pews in the back were always empty. And they, and they got filled fast, thank God. But what happened is the order of sitting was little children, because they were excited about what, the illustrations that were going on. Then came after little children came the teenagers, after teenagers, youth, young professionals, and the rest. And that's how our church was starting to sit down. Because we saw that something was very important to us, so we decided to make a change. Now, let me tell you something. We never, ever watered down the message of the Bible. We never did that. In fact, I started teaching my kids theological concepts. We started talking theology. We started talking about the story of the Bible, and they were eating that up. And what's more, I, I would get them involved. They were always in the platform with us. I remember... Uh, from New Zealand, Leadership New Zealand went to visit my church once uh, with, with, uh, uh, with some folks uh, from our conference, uh, the conference I was, uh, I, I was at at the moment, at the time. And they came in. I remember our young adults that day, we were going to preach about Ezekiel chapter 37. And so we put this loud music to introduce everything. And they walked in and they were just walking around. And as soon as the music was off, all of them felt like they were dead. They just fell to the floor. And I walked in, and I started preaching the word. And so I preach, I preach about the dry bones. You know, we started, and they were the dry bones. They had flesh on it, but, you know, it was a little bit advanced. But <laughs> you, we were working with that, and, and it was just, uh, it, was, it was something that they felt part of. And, and not only that, they started themselves to create, they started utilizing their creativity. And this is the thing. We need to trust them in their creativity. When their creativity shows up, let's not shoot it down. Let's empower it. Let's give it some mentorship, but let's empower it, even if it fails. Even if it fails. Because I remember this one group of kids, they stood up in front of the church, and they were going to do this one thing, and it was, it was bad. It was really bad. And I was like, I, I was shrinking in my, in my chair, and I was thinking to myself, I, I feel bad for them because I know that they're seeing that, it, you know, that no, no, nobody was connecting, et cetera. But you, you're there for them. And you sit down with them, okay, what, what happened? Ah, oh, I, I think I, I forgot this and this and that. And you kind of work with them, and then you bring them back again. And when I, we brought them back again, they did it well. And it, and it, it did the impact that it did. So, so we have to, the how is we need to get messy with them. We need to, to, to try untried methods. We need to surprise people. We need to surprise them. 